Oof. Well, centrist stats are crying now, aren't they? One of their icons, the former Conservative Cabinet Minister Rory Stewart, has staged an intervention which is going to have a lot of people with FPP in their Twitter bios frothing, to put it gently. Now, in an interview with Navarra's Ashaka, he made this defence of, wait for it, Jeremy Corbyn. Have a listen. I want to move on from Jeremy Corbyn, but I mean, it's kind of striking that he's another 2019 casualty, right? Incidentally, I think it's disgusting he was thrown out of the Labour Party. Just as I also think it was pretty peculiar that Boris Johnson kicked out two chances, the Exchequer, six cabinet ministers, Winston Churchill's grandson, and the rest of us out of the Conservative Party. I mean, it's mad. Jeremy Corbyn, whatever you think of him, is a major figure who represents a very significant part of Labour history and heritage. He was the leader of the party. Why do you think Keir Starmer did it? I think he is running a very controlling business with about three or four people trying to micromanage the Labour Party. I think he lacks confidence. I mean, I, I, I believe in politics as being about embracing difference and compromise and persuasion and conversations amongst different people. I was proud to be in debates on Afghanistan with Jeremy Corbyn. I listened to him carefully. Paul Flynn I liked a lot. And I think that Parliament is better when it encompasses those people. Now, I don't think that's necessarily about the voting record, but I definitely think it's about voices and personalities. So a few things here. Now, Rory Stewart's own rise to status of respected near hero amongst so-called centrists came in 2018, 2019 or so. And that phenomenon actually had a lot to do with the so-called centrist approach to Jeremy Corbyn himself. You see, Stewart may well have supported Remain, as Jeremy Corbyn did, despite various conspiracy theories arguing that he didn't. But his position was to accept the referendum result and indeed to champion Theresa May's deal, which was a significantly harder Brexit than anything Jamie Corbyn had ever proposed. But in 2019, Corbyn not only had backed a softer Brexit, he was pivoting towards supporting a second referendum with Remain on the ballot. Now, that was the consequence of the Remain movement, which mobilised huge numbers from 2017 onwards and succeeded in persuading a large chunk of Labour voters and members that only a new referendum was acceptable. I think in hindsight, a lot of people would go, maybe could have settled for a softer Brexit than the one we've currently got and not ended up with a hard right Conservative government anyway. But you see, for the leading centrist Remainers, that pivot wasn't good enough. The goalposts always shifted. There was never anything that actually the Labour leadership in that period could ever have signed up for. Uh, which would have been acceptable. Note what happened after the election when Keir Starmer whipped Labour MPs to back to vote for Boris Johnson's hardest possible Brexit, um, which a lot of people who have rej rejoined in their Twitter bios seem to be fine with. That's um, interesting as on its own terms, I would say. But you see, Roy Stewart, opponent of a new referendum and supporter of Theresa May's deal, harder than anything Labour suggested, became a big hero for many of these so-called centrists. And it should be said, this is a Conservative politician who has voted for some very damaging policies which have inflicted a huge amount of suffering. Take, for example, the attacks on the welfare state, whether that be on disabled people or low-paid workers. That's just one example of Tory policy, which obviously he backs. Now, he's actually said he regretted supporting policies he didn't believe in, whichever they might specifically happen to be. Some might have suggested the principled resignation might have been in order. But anyway, that's, you know, we're getting sidetracked. What he has tried to do since his parliamentary career ended is position himself as a kind of non-partisan centre-right thinker, which brings us to Jamie Corbyn's purge from the Labour Party. This was by Keir Starmer, who served in Corbyn's shadow cabinet, supposedly repeatedly campaigned for him to become Prime Minister, actually campaigned alongside Keir Starmer in the general election of 2019 to make Jeremy Corbyn Prime Minister. Said he was 100% behind him just weeks before that last terrible election. And after the general election defeat, repeatedly called him a, a, friend, a friend while he was campaigning to be leader of the Labour Party and denounced the media attacks on him. Just listen to this, for example. Well, look, the attacks on Jeremy Corbyn in that election we've just had were terrible. And they came back at us on the door. They vilified him and they knew what they were doing and they knew why they were doing it. 
and they do it to every Labour leader, and they know why they're doing it. Now, the basis for Corbyn being kicked out of a party uh, having the whip withdrawn, I should say, actually, he's still a member of the Labour Party. It's the whip. He can't sit as a Labour MP. That's basically the Labour leadership get to decide that. Um, but he's been beaten out. He joined the Labour Party um, when Keir Stam was three years old. And the basis for him being kicked out was the e his response to the EHRC report. Now, whatever you think of his response, it is frequently misquoted. It argued that the complaint system wasn't fit for purpose when he took over. It wasn't. It was a mess, to be honest. And that substantial art changes were made when left-wing ally Jenny Formby became General Secretary in 2018. And that is absolutely true. Uh, dealing with complaints was sped up uh, and professionalised uh, and there was an increase in disciplinary action against those accused of anti-Semitism, including action against people who were just clearly anti-Semites and people or people who were just gratuitously insensitive about the issue. Now, he also called for all the findings of the HRC report to be implemented. He did take issue with some of the findings and declared one anti-Semite is one too many, but the scale of the problem was also dramatically overstated for political reasons by our opponents inside and outside the party, as well by much of the media. Now, if I'm going to be honest, I did not think this sentence was wise, and nor did I, nor did I really understand what it was supposed to achieve. Um, now, that said, listen to this clip, for example, from the... 2019 general election campaign. It's, it's appalling for this country that if we do have a general election at the moment, we're going to face a choice between Coco the Clown's degenerate younger brother and a man who wants to reopen Auschwitz. I mean, oh, this, no, 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 this no, is no. just terrible. No, no, wow. I can't let you get away with that. You Simon, cannot say that. You can't say that. But I mean, why has he turned a blind eye to all these rabid anti Semites well, in his house? Hang on, rabbi, rabbi, you, rabbi, you, rabbi. Ca you cannot say that the leader of the Labour Party, whatever you think of him, would intend to do that. That is. That well, really is. I'm, I'm sure in 1933 they had similar conversations in Germany. Okay, okay, so never going to do that. Can I, can okay, I before you do now, you can see if you're a guy who's been accused by high profile commentators of quite literally wanting to recommence the physical mass extermination of the Jewish people, of being a second Adolf Hitler, you can see why you'd end up saying that the scale of the problem is exaggerated. Even if we're talking about questions of racism, it's always best to focus on talking empathetically to those who suffer from it. Now, my position was always to defend Corbyn against accusations of anti-Semitism, which I did over and over again. And boy, do I have the scars on my back. Um, I've never, never even for one second, believed Jamie Corbyn's anti-Semitic. Never, ever crossed my mind that that was something that he was. I would never have supported him at any point if I thought he, he was anti-Semitic. Keir Starmer as well. If Keir Starmer actually thought he was anti-Semitic, then... He's a disgrace for, share, for serving in the shadow cabinet and arguing for him to become prime minister. So he either didn't think that, in which case we're agreeing, or he did think that, in which case he's a disgrace. Because I think anyone who actually thinks someone's an anti-Semite and then campaigns for them is a disgrace. So where's that leave us? Anyway, I will never believe, believe he's anti-Semitic, not to the day I die. Now, I also believe the left had to do more to listen empathetically to Jewish people, a minority which has suffered 2,000 years of persecution and all the collective trauma that brings. I'm also disturbed by the number of Jewish people who've been kicked out the Labour Party over questions related to anti-Semitism. There's a disturbing number, a disproportionate number of Jewish people. Now, the Jewish people have never been homogenous. It's always had, obviously, like any minority, a very broad range of views. And I'm disturbed by many cases of, of those who've had action taken against them. Look, I don't want to relitigate all of that. What I would say is, Roy Stewart has Jewish heritage himself. He has a Jewish wife. I think those accusing him of lacking empathy towards Jewish people need to take a step back, given that context. Now, the point is the people around Starmer use this as an excuse, in my view. They, they wanted an excuse to kick him out, and they were always going to find an excuse. Why do I say that? Because some of them were briefing. It was a clause for moment. They're referring to when Tony Blair reformed the Labour Party constitution to abandon its commitment to public ownership. Um, and that was seen, it's always caused a clause for a moment when it, the party basically shows we're not left-wing enough. We're not saying we're not left-wing anymore. And that's what they briefed it was. And the truth is, the people around Starmer want to purge the left forever. They want to crush the left, they want to drive the left out of politics forever. And that began with purging Corbyn. This is not paranoia. Morgan McSweeney ran Liz Kendall's campaign. She was the Blairite candidate in 2015. She got 4.5%. He realised that saying what you actually think in a leadership campaign was not a good idea. And so ran Starmer's campaign when instead he said, well, 
Let's have a candidate who says, we support nationalisation, we support taxing the rich, we support abolishing tuition fees, um, and then just abandon all those commitments when he becomes leader. Now, according to his friend and ally, Nick Forbes, who was the leader of Newcastle City Council, he doesn't have room for compromise with a hard left. He thinks they need to be eradicated from the party because they are so dangerous. As I say, not paranoia. That's what they've set out to do. You can see that in selections when anyone to, uh, on the left, anyone who supports the policies that Keir Starmer stood on in the leadership campaign cannot become a Labour MP except in about one or two examples he's managed to slip through. That is how Kafkaesque the situation is. Now, I genuinely believe that there is a plan to purge left-wing MPs on the brink of the, on the eve of the next election. Um, and they'll do that um, on the very eve of the election, uh, so they won't have time to stand or raise money or campaign or whatever to be effective. Um, I'll talk more about that, but that is something that I'm absolutely convinced is going to happen. But I do think what Rory Stewart is just saying, I don't think he has any ulterior motive to say what he said. I think he's just observing an obvious fact that what happened to Jeremy Corbyn was a factional manoeuvre by a very, the most authoritarian leadership in the history of the Labour Party, which has decided that the Labour Party is not just a hostile environment for so-called Corbynites, but a hostile environment for the so-called soft left, a hostile environment for anyone to the left of Peter Mandelson. That's where things are heading. They think Lisa Nandy's too left-wing. That's the, the plight of the Labour Party in 2023. And I think it's commendable that Rory Stewart is honest enough to talk about it. Please like, subscribe, do support us on patreon.com forward slash ownjazz84. And I'll see you in a bit.